Okay, Boker Tov. I hope you all had an easy and meaningful Yom Kippur, a cleansing and purifying Yom Kippur. Anyone who's ever been to Yerushalayim during these days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot can testify that there's a, a unique energy in the air, a frenzy. The city is abuzz with activity. The excitement is palpable. I was just with my kids yesterday at the Shuk Machane Yuda and the Shuk Arbat Aminim there. And you know, people are in the streets and flooding the markets, buying their Dalit Minim, buying supplies for their Sukkot, supplies for the Chag, food for the Chag. And there's something magical in the air. And so this morning, Birshut Chem, I'd like to explore together with you these special days in between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, these days that we are in the midst of this connection between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, and ask the question, what is the source of our simcha, our joy, our rejoicing, on Chag HaSukkot, which is called Zman Simchatenu, the time of our rejoicing, its, it's very identity. What is that, where does that come from? What's the source of our simcha? But first, a more <laughs> preliminary or basic question, a more fundamental question. Why do we celebrate Sukkot this time of year? And it's very strange. If you take a look here at source number one, the Pasuk or the Psukim in Vayikra Perek Chav Gimel instruct us, Basukot Yeshvu Shivat Yamim Kol Ezrach B'Yisrael Yeshvu Basukot. We are to sit, all residents of Israel, in Sukkot for seven days. And the next pasuk, Leman yedu dorotechem, ki vasukot hoshavti et b'nei Yisrael, so that your future generations will know, for I caused the Jewish people to dwell in booths, behotzi otam me'eretz Mitzrayim. When I took them out of Egypt, ani Hashem elokechem, I am Hashem your God. So the Torah connects the mitzvah, to sit in Sukkot and to celebrate the holiday of Sukkot with Yitziat Mitzrayim, with the exodus from Egypt. So again, why do we celebrate Sukkot this time of year if it's all about Yitziat Mitzrayim? Maybe it should follow immediately Pesach, right? Pesach commemorates how Hashem took us out of Egypt, and then maybe, you know, I'll give us a few weeks to recover from all the cleaning and koshering and cooking, but maybe then we should celebrate Sukkot sometime in the spring following Pesach, because after all, it commemorates how Hashem protected us in these booths when he took us out of Egypt. So take us out of Egypt, let's commemorate that in Nisan when it happened, and then, you know, when we're wandering around in the Midbar, shortly after, let's celebrate Sukkot, or maybe, one could suggest, why not celebrate Pesach and Sukkot together. Certainly would save a lot of money, <laughs> right? Now the kids might not appreciate it because it would mean less vacation. And for some reason, I don't know why, these uh, goinim here in, uh, in, in Israel decided, I don't know if you, you, you are familiar with this word, gesher. Now we all thought gesher is, you know, the, the gesher meitarim, the string bridge, or, you know, all these bridges that they're building uh, by, uh, you know, kvish echad, but there's this new, <laughs> new uh, content, connotation, the new, new mashma'ut, new meaning of the word gesher, bridge. It means we're going to give the kids off the week between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, and we're going to bridge the two. And actually, we'll see. Maybe, maybe there is a connection. Maybe it actually works thematically. It might be difficult for parents of small children because you have to figure out what to do with them during that gesher, that bridge, those days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. But maybe it is fitting. Maybe there is a connection. But why don't we celebrate Sukkot together with Pesach, right? Have the seder inside of the sukkah, save a lot of time, save a lot of money, save another Yom Tov that you have to spend with your in-laws, <laughs> right? <laughs> Pesach and Sukkot, come on. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. I love, I love my in-laws in case they're watching. <laughs> But actually, they live in Teaneck, New Jersey. So more often now, they, they come and, and spend Yom Tov with us here. We love them. 
Um, but why not have the Pesach Seder inside of the sukkah with matzah and four cups of wine and four questions? Why do we celebrate Sukkot Dafka now in the month of Tishrei? So take a look here at source number two. This is the tour at the very beginning of Hilchot Sukkah in Siman Tafresh Chafhe. The tour asks this question, and he writes, Even though we left Egypt in the month of Nisan, we were not commanded to celebrate Sukkot then in Nisan. Why? And he gives a, a very practical answer. Because Nisan, the spring, is already it introduces the summer months. The weather is already starting to get warm. And everyone goes out in Nisan, in the spring, in the summer months. Everyone is spending time outside. Everyone is making a sukkah, so to speak. Everyone is sitting on their mere peset, in their gazebo, under their pergola. Velo bahem. And were we to celebrate Sukkot and sit in Sukkot in the spring, it would not be nikeret, it would not be recognizable that we are doing it for the sake of the fulfillment of the mitzvah of Hashem, of our Creator. Therefore, Therefore, we are commanded to sit in Sukkot now in the seventh month, the month of Tishrei, which is already the rainy season, or it begins the rainy season. Of course, we don't want it to rain on Sukkot while we're sitting in our uh, sukkah. We wait till after Sukkot to pray for rain, of course. But what the tour is saying is, if we would celebrate it in Nisan, it wouldn't be obvious that we're doing it for the sake of the mitzvah. People would think we're just going outside and sitting on our mere pesit to enjoy the nice weather. Right? By the way, the assumption here being that it would be fitting to celebrate in Nisan or in the spring together with Pesach because after all, as we began with, the mitzvah to sit in Sukkot is to remember how Hashem took us out of Eretz Mitzrayim. So that's the implicit assumption here of the tour. That's what he's beginning with. But he says, rather, we're commanded now in the month of Tishrei, which is, you know, it's starting to rain, it's starting to get cool, and, oh, so now we sit outside, and so it, it's obvious to any onlookers that we're not sitting outside for our health, for the weather, to enjoy the, the sun, but we're sitting outside for the sake of the fulfillment of this mitzvah. Typically, this time of year, everyone leaves their sukkah. Everyone leaves their mere peset, their pergola, and goes back inside their home. However, but we, Jewish people, we go out of the home, so it's obvious to all that the command of the king is upon us to perform it. In other words, everyone is going back inside the house as the weather begins to get cold, right? And all of a sudden, we go outside so that it's obvious to any onlookers that we're doing it not to enjoy the weather, but for the sake of the performance of the mitzvah. This is the famous reason of the tour. However, the tour lived in Spain. The tour, uh, we're talking 13th, 14th century Spain. This is Rabbi Yaakov ben Asher, the son of the Rush. Oh, right. Right, it, it is pleasant, although I was out with my kids yesterday, and I said, oh, Machai, all of a sudden, it started to get a little cool. There was a nice breeze. And, it, and you do feel a sudden change in the weather, right? Especially the other week. It got warmer over, uh, over Yom Kippur, but, uh, and then maybe, uh, you know, Shabbat Shuvah also. But before, a couple weeks ago, there was a, a change in the weather. I noticed because I got sick. <laughs> I got sick over Rosh Hashanah. It, it did get a little cooler. Even here in Israel, um, the weather changes. And then you notice right after Sukkot, it starts to get windy and rain. That's why my wife is always begging me to take down the sukkah like right after Sukkot. Don't wait because anytime you wait, it rains and then your schach gets all moldy. Okay. Um, but 
the answer here of the tour is a little bit difficult because if the whole reason why we're commanded to celebrate now is that it be recognizable, nikeret in the Lashon of the tour, um, so why not celebrate Sukkot, I don't know, in November or December or January? So then certainly, no matter where you are, whether you're in Spain in the 13th, 14th century or you're here in Israel in 5784, it, it would certainly be recognizable that you're not sitting outside to enjoy the weather, that you're doing it for the performance of the mitzvah. So in other words, if the whole issue is the weather, so again, it doesn't really answer the question, why, why Dafka Tishrei? Why not Cheshvan? Why not Kislev, right? So there must be a, a, a deeper reason as to why Sukkot is celebrated this time of year. And I mean, is it just arbitrary that it's in Tishrei? Just a few days after Yom Kippur? I mean, there must be some connection, right? Why Dafka Tishrei? I mean, don't we have enough holidays? So people who live in Chutzlaaretz always, uh, you know, are, are expressing their, I guess, uh, difficulty, the con how, how they, f they, they feel conflicted or they uh, have, have issues at work because their boss doesn't understand why they need to take off so many days in September, right? right we need another week off. Well, you need another week off. Uh, that's why, I, unfortunately, at least, you know, where I was a rabbi in uh, North America, a lot of people work over Chol HaMoed. You're really not supposed to work over Chol HaMoed. It's nice here in Israel where people have the luxury of being able to take off over Chol HaMoed and spend it with their families. You're really not supposed to work unless you can't afford not to work on Chol HaMoed. It's you know, beyond the scope of our discussion this morning. But, uh, and the irony is, of course, people in, in the United States will always say, oh, I, well, I, look, I have to work on Chol HaMoed. It's my job. I have to work. You know, yet they'll use all their vacation days in like late December, early January to go uh, on a ski trip somewhere. You know, they really should use their vacation days on Chol HaMoed. Anyway, whatever, I, I digress. Um, but is it, is it merely just about the weather, right? If so, it, it would seem arbitrary. Why Dafka the month of Tishri? So there must be a connection between Sukkot and the days which immediately precede it. There must be a connection between the Yemei Hadin, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, I mean, it's, it can't just be a coincidence that we're observing Sukkot now, this time of year. So here at Source 3, it's, it's a little bit difficult to read because of the type. Uh, it hasn't been digitized. This is the comments of the Gra, the Gon Mi Vilna, to Shir Hashirim. I'll just summarize what he says, and we'll see a similar idea in the Aruch HaShulchan here in Source number 4. But here in Source number 3, the Gon is commenting uh, on a pasuk in the first chapter of Shir Hashirim, Perek Aleph, Pasuk Dalid, Moshcheni Yacharecha, Narutza Heviani Hamelech Hadarav, Nagila, Vinis Mechabach, Naskira Dodechem Yayin, Mesharim Ahevucha. Draw me after you, let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. Let us delight and rejoice in your love. So the, the delighting and the rejoicing for the Vilna Gon is an allusion to Sukkot and Shmini Atzeret, Simchat Torah, which is the climax of the festival, of course. But he's commenting here in source number three on these words, Heviani HaMelech Chadarav. The king brought me into his chamber, into his room, his Chadar. So what is that an allusion to for the Vilna Gon? It's an allusion to the Sukkah. And what the Vilna Gon says here is that it's not arbitrary, it's no coincidence that we observe Sukkot this time of year, just a, a few days from Yom Kippur. But the connection between Yom Kippur and Sukkot is deeply rooted in our historical experience. Because according to the Vilna Gon, and this, this we know on Yom Kippur, of course, the Jewish people were forgiven from or for the sin of the golden calf, the Chet Egel. But for the Vilna Gon, after the Chet Egel, the Ananeha Kavod, the clouds of glory, which the Sukkah represents, we'll see in a few moments, the Sukkah represents the Ananeha Kavod, the clouds of glory that protected the Jewish people in the wilderness were removed from them following the Chet Egel. But says the Vilna Gon here, 
it was on Yom Kippur that the Jewish people were forgiven for the sin of the golden calf, and then the clouds of glory returned to the Jewish people when on Sukkot. So according to the Gon, the holiday of Sukkot commemorates the return of the Ananiah Kavod, and with them, the Shechina, the Divine Presence. As Sukkot, he writes, coincides with the beginning of the construction of the Mishkan. And this explains the Vilna Gon is why Sukkot is celebrated dafka this time of year, immediately following Yom Kippur. It's not arbitrary. It's not just a coincidence. It's not that we observe Sukkot now because of the weather, but there's this intimate connection, this deep connection between Sukkot and the days which immediately precede it. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The Jewish people sinned and experienced slicha, mechila, kapara, ritsui, and so too we, each and every year, we are forgiven, we are cleansed, we go through this whole process of the Yemei Hadin, and then we come to Sukkot, and Hashem surrounds us with His presence, with His clouds of glory, as represented by the sukkah. Take a look here at the Aruch HaShulchan, here in source number four. The Aruch HaShulchan doesn't cite the Vilna Gon directly, but he articulates a similar idea. He writes, After quoting the tour, which we saw in source number two, he says there's another reason. Why we observe Sukkot now, in the month of Tishrei, not in Nisan, God wants to show us that even though we've sinned, He has not removed His presence, His providence from us. And we sit in His shade, in the protection of His wings. And just like after the giving of the Torah, the Jewish people sinned with the golden calf, right? And afterwards, Hashem became appeased. This is Ritsui. There are different levels to this process of Tshuva and slicha, mechila, the process of what we, I think, mistranslate often as repentance, but there's different levels. There's, there's forgiveness, there's pardon, there's atonement, right? And then there's ritsui. It's, it's that closeness. It's often translated maybe as a appeasement, but that too doesn't really capture the word. It's as if, you know, sometimes it could be a couple could be friends, could be family, where there's a falling out and then there's a reconciliation. And there's forgiveness. And then the relationship is often deepened following the tear, following the whatever it was, the sikhsuch, following the fight, following the disagreement or dispute. Sometimes actually strengthens the relationship. So that's the Ritsui. That's what he's referring to here. After the Jewish people were forgiven and pardoned and atoned for, but then there was this Ritsui. With the second tablets, that took place on Yom Kippur. And after Yom Kippur, As I said, the Vilna Gon, says this, that after Yom Kippur, we were commanded to begin the construction of the Mishkan, which represents God's pro providence and uh, His presence, really. How His presence will dwell among us, right? It says, V'asuli mikdash v'shachanti betocham, and I will dwell among them. So it represents this closeness that was achieved with Hashem following the Chet Egel. And Hashem did not remove from them the Ananei Kavod, or as the Vilna Gon writes, the clouds of glory, the Ananei Kavod, were returned to the Jewish people at that point. Okay? 
So uh, just uh, we, we, can, we can skip the rest. He, he draws on a, uh, a different pasuk here of, uh, of Shir Hashirim at the end, which also expresses that love, that closeness, that intimacy. A pasuk from the third perek, uh, the third chapter of, of Shir Hashirim here. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the second chapter. It's uh, Perek Bet Pasuk Gimel. Not Perek Gimel Pasuk Gimel. Perek Bet Pasuk Gimel. Kitapuach Batseayar Ken Dodi Ben Abanim Bitzilo Chimaditi Vyashafti. I found his shade. Bitzilo Chimaditi. I loved his shade. His shade was, was, was beautiful, was beloved to me. Vyashafti. And I sat there, of course. This is a reference to what? Or for. The Aruch HaShulchan, a hint, a remez, an allusion to what? The sukkah, right? I'm, I'm sitting in this beautiful shade of Hashem, ufiryo matok lechiki, and his fruit is sweet to my palate. What's that an allusion to, that pre? The etrog, right? The Dalad Minim, okay. So uh, here the Aruch HaShulchan brings a different verse from Shir Hashim, which expresses this idea how the sukkah and the holiday of Sukkot represents that love and that intimacy, which is a product of the slicha, mechila, kapara, ritsui, which is achieved on Yom Kippur. Take a look here at source number five. There's a beautiful custom to begin building the sukkah immediately following Yom Kippur, right? I don't know uh, if people do this in your neighborhood, but certainly in my neighborhood. They come home, they have something to eat, and then they start on the sukkah. By the way, the minog's not to finish <laughs> building the sukkah. You don't have to keep your neighbors up all night as you're pounding away and hammering and drilling, and like they do in Harnov, blasting music from your rooftops. There's no mitzvah. Motzei Yom Kippur, <laughs> to keep your neighbors up for hours, okay? The minhag was to begin to build the sukkah, to do a little something. You know, maybe, you know, bring your schach out on your mirpeset or something. To do a little something, okay? That was the minhag. And it also, it's a, it's a beautiful thing this time of year, you know, it's some, there's something so magical about it on those, uh, you know, moonlit mirpasaot, moonlit balconies, people beginning the preparations for the holiday of Sukkot right after Yom Kippur. And I think, as I'll, I'll try and demonstrate, I think this too expresses this connection, this intimate connection between Yom Kippur and Chag Sukkot. So t- turn the page here in source number five, the Ramah, at the very end of Hilchot Yom Kippur. This is very interesting. The very end of Siman Tafrei Shchav Dalit, which is the last section in the laws of Yom Kippur, the very last section. The Ramah writes, where I've underlined on the next side, the Hamedaktikim matchilim miyad b'motzei Yom Kippurim ba'asiyat sukkah. The Medaktikim, those who are scrupulous in their performance of mitzvot, they begin immediately following Yom Kippur with the construction of the sukkah, k'day latzeit mi mitzvah el mitzvah, in order to go from one mitzvah to another. Right? We want to go from one mitzvah to another. Beautiful. You spent the whole day in prayer and fasting. You go from one mitzvah to another. And then the Ramah repeats himself. And in the first siman of Hilchot Sukkah, here in source number six, he cites the very same minhag, where I've underlined, There's a mitzvah to construct the sukkah immediately following Yom Kippur. When a mitzvah comes in your hand, you shall not push it off. You shall not delay. Okay. Gives a little bit of a different reason in Tafrei Shchavdal that he says to connect one mitzvah to another. In Tafrei Shchavhei, he says when a mitzvah comes into your hand, when you have an opportunity to do a mitzvah, you shouldn't push it off. Okay, fine. But why does the Ramah record this minhag twice? The Ramah always so careful in the way he formulates his comments on the Shulchan Aruch, so meticulous, why does he cite this custom twice? Right? And what's the reason for the practice? Can't the sukkah wait until the next day, until, you know, your kids are willing to help you, until they come and visit and help you put up the sukkah? And, again, why, why in both the laws of Yom Kippur 
and the laws of, of Sukkot. Very strange why he, he mentions this custom twice. Right? Very strange. So the Mishnah Bura, I didn't put it on the sheets here, but the Mishnah Bura explains simply that the first time the Ramah records the Minhag, he uses this language of hamidaktikim, those who are scrupulous in their performance of mitzvot. They begin immediately, and the Mishnah Bura says everyone else begins the next day, right? So maybe that's why the Ramah cites the Minhag twice. One for the Midaktakim, and then again for those who, you know, uh, are not so Midaktik. Right? But, okay, uh, that's an interesting answer. It doesn't really, if you look at the language of the Ramah, even in Tafri Shafei, he talks about how you should begin immediately. So, Miyad Lachar Yom Kippur. And this answer also is difficult because the Maharil, which major source for Ashkenazic practice, Ashkenazic minhag, who the Ramah cites very often, and that, it would seem, is the source for this minhag. There, the Maharil makes no distinction between Midaktakim and everyone else. In fact, if you take a look at the Maharil, in the Loshon of the Maharil, he writes that every individual should be involved in constructing the sukkah immediately following Yom Kippur. Not just the Midaktakim. So again, perhaps there's a deeper answer. And maybe by building the sukkah immediately following Yom Kippur, we are expressing or giving expression to this intimate connection between Chaga Sukkot and Yom Kippur and Yom Adin, Rosh Hashanah, the days which immediately precede it. And by mentioning this custom, by recording this custom, both at the very end of the laws of Yom Kippur and the very beginning of the laws of Sukkot, maybe the Ramah is stressing this connection. That they're not really two separate entities. They're really part of a unit, a cycle, this time of year in Chodesh Tishrei. You go from atonement and purification and cleansing to sitting in the sukkah surrounded by the Shekhinah, surrounded by the divine presence, surrounded by his love. And take a look here at source number seven. These are the comments of Rav Shlomo Kluger, the Chochmat Shlomo here, to Shulchan Aruch. And he cites this custom, and he's commenting on it, and he writes, look where I've underlined, Ach, biyom ha-kipurim she-Yisrael osin tshuva. On Yom Kippur, when the Jewish people repent, az mechassin avonam mimenu yidbarach umashlich otam bim tzolot. Hashem covers over, so to speak, their sins. Their sins are covered over, and they are cast out, right, like into the sea. Mashlich otam bim tzolot, bim tzolot yam, right? like we do tashlich, right? So the idea, the idea here is that there's a connection between Yom Kippur and the sukkah. Yom Kippur represents that atonement, that forgiveness, how our sins in the language of the Chochmat Shlomo are covered over, which is then represented by the sukkah, which envelops us. And look, at the very bottom where I've it. Therefore, it is fitting to construct the sukkah immediately following Yom Kippur. Because one follows the other. And since the sukkah alludes to the Ananei Kavod, right, it's actually a, a machloket tanaim between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva, if the sukkah represents the Ananea Kavod, or Sukkot Mamash, real booths, physical booths that Hashem protected us with in the wilderness. Either way you slice it, it represents divine protection, right? But uh, it seems that maybe we, we rule that the Sukkot represents the Ananea Kavod. That's, that's what the Shulchan Aruch records. In any case, if the Sukkot represents these clouds of glory which protected us from the 
the, the harsh sun and elements in the wilderness and represents divine protection. So therefore, Therefore, it is fitting to make the sukkah right after Yom Kippur. Because it, it's intimately connected. It, one follows the other. Right? It, it corresponds. Okay. So, according to Rav Shlomo Kluger, we begin building the sukkah right after Yom Kippur. For Hashem, so to speak, covers over our sins, and then the, the sukkah covers us, or Hashem covers us with his sukkah. I would frame it or formulate it slightly differently. I would say during these incredible days between the days of awe and Sukkot, we go from a place of purity, lifnei Hashem titaru, to a place of peace. Haporei sukkat shalom aleinu. And immediately following Yom Kippur, the preparations of the holiday begin. We run around, we build the sukkah, we buy our dalad minim. As I said, there's this magic in the air that's it's palpable. It's tangible. And all of a sudden, we are surrounded by all sorts of mitzvot. And that, too, according to many, represents a gift from Hashem, represents His love that was achieved during these days, the Yemei Hadin, which precedes Sukkot. All of a sudden, the individual is surrounded by mitzvot, an opportunity to do so many mitzvot, the Dalad Minim and the Sukkah and Simchat Yom Tov, right? That is a, a gift, so to speak, which represents that love. On Sukkot, we carry our lulav through the streets like a banner, like a flag, raised, expressing confidence that we were victorious in judgment just days prior. And while we are obligated to rejoice during every festival, Sukkot is Zman Simchatenu. It is the time of our rejoicing. In fact, the mitzvah of Simchat Yom Tov, Vesamachta Bechagecha, is stated in the context of Sukkot. Sukkot is the source for the mitzvah to experience and express joy during our festivals. That is its very identity. Pesach is, right, what? It's Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Right? Shavuot is Zman Matan Torah What is Sukkot? Well, as we saw, according to the Torah, it's also connected to Yitzhak Mitzrayim. So why don't we call, what? Sukkot also Zman Cherutenu, the time of our freedom, right? Or maybe you could uh, construct something, the time of divine protection, right? But instead, it's Zman Simchatenu. That is its very identity. Well, what is the source for all that joy? As I said, it's the paradigm of the joyful celebration. It's called Vichag. It's called Hechag. Right? In the Torah, it's just called Vichag. In the Mishnah, it's called Chag. Bechag nidonin alamayim, the Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah says. On Vichag, we are judged for how much rainfall there's going to be over the course of the year. Well, what is the Chag? We have a, a, a number of Chagim. Vichag is Sukkot. It is the paradigm of the festival. It is the source for the midst of rejoicing. That is its very identity. Well, where does that come from? So I think by now it should be obvious that joy is a result of our closeness with God. That closeness that we have achieved during these days which immediately precede Chag HaSukkot. Now, the Mishnah and Gemara in the last parak of Masechet Sukkah, describes the Simchat Beit HaShoeva, these incredible festivals that they would have in the Beit HaMikdash in the evening. Mishnah describes how Motzei Yom Tov Harishon, uh, the, uh, following the, the uh, first day of Yom Tov, the Motzei Yom Tov Harishon Shel Chag, they would go and, and 
they would have these big celebrations in the Beit HaMikdash, and they would light uh, candles and torches, and the whole city of Yerushalayim would be lit up, and uh, the, the uh, Levim would be playing music, and uh, the great scholars, the Hasidim, and Anshe Maase would celebrate, and they would dance, and uh, the, the Talmud describes how the great sages would do all sorts of juggling acts and juggle with, with torches and do backflips, you know, I think it sounds almost like a, a La Havdil a circus or something. But that was a tremendous joy. And the Mishnah says, Mi shelo ra'a simchat beta shoiva lo ra'a simcha miyamav. And the Rambam here, in source number eight, he writes that in the temple, there was an chaga sukkot simcha yitera. Afal pi here in Halacha Yudbet. This is the Rambam towards the end of Hilchot Lulav, Perek Chet, Halachi Yudbedi writes, Afal pi adot mitzvah lismach behem. Even though it's a commandment, a mitzvah to celebrate during all of our festivals, Bechag HaSukot Haita Sham Bamigdash Simcha Yitera. In the Beit HaMikdash, there was an additional level of Simcha. And of course, he's describing the Simchat Beit HaShoeva. Shenemar usmachtem lifnei Hashem elokechem shivat yamim. Because the Pasuk says, it says, you shall take your, your lolov and your etrog, right? Lachem. And how does the Pasuk end? And you shall rejoice before God for seven days. And that means in the temple. We'll come back to that Pasuk in a few moments. Okay? And as I mentioned, the Mishnah and the Gemara describe just how these, these, these celebrations were observed in the Beit HaMikdash, the Simchat Beit HaShoeva, incredible, right? And take a look, the Rambam, he, he, he makes an interesting observation. You know, as I said, the Mishnah mentions how the Hasidim and Anshe Ma'aseh, righteous individuals and, you know, very unique individuals, let's call them the, the rabbis, men of distinction. Well, if you want to get fancy, Anshe Ma'aseh, okay. Uh, how they would dance and and then the Talmud describes uh, certain rabbis and exactly what they would do and the types of dances, etc. And so the Rambam makes a very interesting observation where I've underlined here in Halacha Yudalid, in source number eight. He writes, V'lo hayu osin ota amei ha'aretz v'kol mi she'yirtse. The Rambam makes this interesting observation. It wasn't just anyone who would dance and celebrate. They are playing music, right? The Khalil and the instruments, the Mishnah and the Gemara describes, and all the fanfare and all the pomp and ceremony. And the Rambam says, but it wasn't anyone who was dancing. It wasn't the Ameha Aretz. It wasn't the simple folk, let's call them. And it wasn't just anyone, local Mishirtse, Ela Gdole Chachame Yisrael, but rather the great wise sages of Israel, the Roshe HaYeshivot, and the heads of the yeshivot, the academies, the Sanhedrin, and the members of the Sanhedrin, the Hasidim, and the righteous, pious ones, the Zekenim, and the elders, the Mas, and the men of distinction. Haim, it was dafka they shehayu meragdin umesabkin uminagnin umesamchin bamigdash bimei chag sukot. It was dafka they who would dance and clap hands and slap and and express joy in the temple during these days. And then he repeats, Avalo kol ha'am, but not anyone. Hanashim v'anashim kulan ba'in lirot v'lishmoa. Rather, the men and women, they would come to watch. They would come to watch. And if you've ever seen what goes on in a Hasidic court during a Simchat Beit HaShoeva, often it's the Rebbe, the Admor, who's in the middle dancing, right? He's dancing, and the Hasidim are all around clapping, dancing with him, but they're watching him. Why? Why? See, this is an interesting observation of the Rambam. As I said, the Mishnah and the Gemara just record how these great individuals, these great rabbis were dancing and clapping and juggling and doing backflips. But the Rambam, he makes this observation. He says, that's because it wasn't appropriate for anyone to just dance and celebrate. It was Dafka, the Rambam writes, the Chachmei Yisrael, the Roshe Yeshivot, the members of the Sanhedrin, the Hasidim, the Kenim, the Anshe Maaseh. It was Dafka, they, who were in the middle, dancing 
and celebrating, and everyone around was just watching. Why? What is, what is the Rambam trying to teach here? I think this speaks to the very essence of what true simcha is and what simchat yom tov is. Those individuals are those who have achieved a certain closeness with Hashem that we've been speaking about this morning. A certain dveikut, a clinging or cleaving to Hashem. And it's through that closeness or because of that closeness, that's what causes them to celebrate. That's what generates this simcha. As we've seen this morning, the simcha of Sukkot, this tremendous joy, which is its very identity as Zman Simchatenu, as the paradigm of joy, which teaches joy for all the other holidays, that joy is generated from that closeness with Hashem. So who better to dance before God than those who are close to Hashem? The righteous individuals, the Chachamim, the members of the Sanhedrin, the Roshe Yeshivot, the Anshe Maase. Who better fitting to dance before God and express that joy if that joy is indeed a result of that intimacy, that closeness with Hashem, than those who are close to Hashem. And this speaks, of course, to the essence of what Simcha is. And it's interesting. The Rambam here at the end of Hilchot Lulav, he sort of waxes poetic and discusses a, a really a, a broader topic, but it's in this context, simcha shel mitzvah, the simcha, the joy that one experiences when performing the tzivoy Hashem, when performing a mitzvah of God. Uh, he even here discusses, he mentions, he ends with a verse about how David HaMelech was dancing before the Aaron. Remember when the Aaron was returned to the Jewish people, David HaMelech, the king of Israel, is kicking up his feet and dancing. His very wife, Michal Bat Shol, says, David, what are you doing? Es pasnisht. I don't know if she spoke Yiddish, but if she did speak Yiddish, she'd say, es pasnisht. You're the Melech of Israel. You're the king of Israel. What are you doing dancing before the Aaron? And he says, no, I'm dancing before Hashem. There's no greater joy. And so the Rambam here is saying there's no greater joy than being in the presence of God. And true simcha, true essence is, the essence of true simcha, the definition of simcha is usmachtem lifnei Hashem elokeichem, being in the presence of Hashem, standing in the presence of God. And that's something that we do during the Yemei Hadin, that's something that we do over Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur, and that's why, as we've discussed in the past, those days too, they're not, they're not depressing days, they're not sad days, yes, they're days of judgment, days of atonement, but they're days of joy, because one is standing before Hashem, one is omed lifnei Hashem, as Rav Salavashik explained. True joy, and, and people today have such a hard time figuring out what, what joy is, what, what is true happiness in life, right? How many, how many self-help books have been written? How many articles, seminars, how much ink has been spilled? How many conferences and courses? I heard that you know, the most popular course today at Harvard University is a course that is taught by an Israeli professor, maybe was taught by an Israeli professor, I don't know if he's there anymore, I think he was maybe just a visiting professor, all about happiness and joy and fulfillment in life and meaning. Everyone's searching for happiness. What is happiness? How do you achieve that? Well, true joy, true simcha, is usmachtem lifnei Hashem elokeichem. Standing before Hashem your God, celebrating before Hashem. It's that closeness with Hashem, that intimacy that we've experienced, that we've achieved over these last few days and weeks, which is expressed during the holiday of Sukkot itself. And wish, w with that, with that, I will wish you all a Chag Sameach. Uh, we will not be meeting one week from today. Next Wednesday, it is Chol HaMoyed Sukkot. You'll be celebrating. You'll be sitting in the Sukkah Surrounded by the Shechina, you will be in the presence of Hashem. I'll take your question. I just want to end with one nice idea. Yes. Please. Uh-huh. Mayan. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. It's beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. The Yerushalmi says, it's called Simchat Beit HaShoeva, drawing. It was, they were celebrating their drawing of the water for the Nisu Hamayim. The Yerushalmi says they were, it was as if they were drawing Ruach HaKodesh. From here they were drawing Ruach HaKodesh. Yonah, we read about Yonah on uh, Yom Kippur. Um, according to Chazal, Yonah began receiving prophecy during the Simchat Beit HaShoeva. So it was this incredible revelation. I'll just end with a beautiful idea which ties it all together, something which is attributed to the Ariya Kadosh, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria. Minimally, in order to be a kosher sukkah, it has to have how many walls? Right, two and the third, afilu tefach. Right, the third minimally has to be a tefach, which is a hand breadth. It's a measurement that's the size of a hand, right? Right, so two walls and the third, afilu tefach, what does that look like? What does that look like? So I once asked a group of high schoolers this question. They said, it looks like a headlock. I said, no. Hashem is not giving us a headlock. It looks like an embrace. Hashem, as we saw, envelops us with the, his shechina, with his presence. When we sit in the sukkah, the sukkah is a divine embrace. Hashem is giving us one big great hug. And after having gone through the days of judgment, isn't that what we need right now? A great big divine hug. Chag Sameach.